Hello, everybody. My name is Deirdre de Burka, and I'm going to be the moderator for today's webinar. So you're very welcome. I hope all of you have managed to connect today and uh, that you can hear me clearly. Um, just to say very briefly, I'm the advocacy coordinator with FORUS, which is a global network um, of national development platforms, 69 national development platforms in every region of the world and seven regional coalitions. And we're very happy to be hosting this call this morning or this afternoon, I should say, it depends on, on where you are in the world, whether it's morning or afternoon. But we're very happy to be co-organizing this webinar on promoting effective civil society engagement with SDG implementation in challenging times with three other global networks. And they are Action for Sustainable Development, the TAP Network and Together 2030. And these four global networks, we work very closely together and we felt it was important at this time after we've started to begin to analyze the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on our work as civil society and particularly in trying to engage with SDG implementation, we felt it was very important to organize a webinar where we invited other civil society particip participants to attend and for us to have a good discussion. Uh, first of all, an overview of the state of play at the moment and then a discussion about how to move forward. So I'm very happy to be able to um, moderate this meeting today. And I'm going to ask our first speaker, Ollie Henman, to um, begin today's uh, session. We have five speakers today. I'm going to ask them to stick to eight minutes each. So I'm going to really be um, quite strict on timing um, because after the speakers speak, I'm going to open up to the floor and when I do, I really would welcome any comments or questions that any of the participants on this call today have to make. I'd invite you to use the raised hand option. So how you do that is if you see at the bottom of your screen a participants icon, you click on that and you'll see all of the participants names, including your own, and you'll see a little option for raise hand. Um, but if you can't do that, if you don't know how to work that, you can also put any questions or comments that you have in the chat box and somebody will be drawing my attention to them. So I'm very happy to, to start this discussion today on, as I said, promoting effective civil society engagement with SDG implementation in challenging times. So I'd like to ask our first speaker, Ollie Henman, who's the Global Coordinator of Action for Sustainable Development, to um, make his input first. So uh, can you make yourself known, Ollie? And we'll begin with your uh, presentation and your slides. Hello. Okay. I'm not hearing um, Ollie at the moment. Ollie, will you make yourself known, please, if you're on the line? I think you are. Hello. Hello. I can. Hello. I'm Marcela Brown from Argentina. Yes. I can hear you very well. Yes. Okay. A little you can slowly, but but well, but okay. clear. Thank you. So, so Marcela, I'm just inviting. I'm asking everybody to mute their microphones, and I'm going to invite our first speaker, Ollie Henman. I see him on the line here. So, Ali, if you could uh, introduce yourself and begin your presentation. Hi, everyone. Yes, uh, apologies uh, there for the uh, technical uh, issue. I I'm actually uh, juggling my uh, homeschooling with my my young uh, boys at the moment, my children. So I'm afraid I, I won't be able to stay for the entire call. Um, but it's great to see so many people on the call um, and it's uh, it's been fantastic to uh, organize this together um, you may see my kids come in here we go yeah <laughs> um, so the presentation that i have for you today um, covers some of the key ways that we support national coalitions and i'll try to keep it uh, to the point um, so if we could go to the next slide please so as we know we are 
Uh, we're at the end of the first four year cycle. We're starting the next cycle of the VNRs. Um, and we have jointly uh, been uh, researching and, and finding out how things have been going in the first four years. So Action for Sustainable Development, for us Together 2030 and TAP, uh, we've been working together and we've each been doing our own uh, research to hear from our members on what the impressions are that they have from the first four years. Um, and we jointly work on um, a project with CCIC, the Canadian Council, uh, on uh, progressing national implementation. So I pulled out a few of the findings from that on this slide. Um, we do know now that most countries uh, are now providing some kind of formal stakeholder engagement uh, space. Um, it varies in different countries. Sometimes that is hosted by the prime minister or the president's office. Sometimes it's by a particular agency. Sometimes it's uh, purely on the civil society side, but there is some kind of engagement uh, happening most of the time uh, in normal times with the VNR, although we know that things are more difficult this year. Uh, we also know that there is a baseline of data in most cases. Um, however, last year we actually saw less in the reports of enr reports about means of implementation and how to actually finance the agenda in different countries so there's still a big gap in terms of actual implementation um, we also noticed that most countries do refer to leave no one behind um, but the targeted support is is not really there uh, not in the way that it should be um, and there's limited progress on the transformative potential. So we think there's a lot more that can be done and member states can, can build on the mutual learning. So sliding on to the next slide, please. Uh, this Again, this highlights some of the findings. I won't go through it again because I think we don't have much time, but uh, most of this I think is shared with all of the colleagues uh, on the call that really one of the key messages is around leaving no one behind and ensuring that civil society has uh, an active and full role both in terms of the monitoring and also the implementation of the agenda. So I'll now go on to the next slide please and here I'm going to go into more practical uh, approaches and this is from our own um, uh, scorecard which we've shared with many of you over the last few years and in fact it was developed very much as a collaborative approach building on the experiences in Kenya, in Sri Lanka, in Brazil and we've tried to bring together um, some key steps that you might take when you're doing your own civil society report as part of the VNR and we called that a scorecard. Um, if we go to the next slide please. So the elements of the scorecard, the first part is what is the current situation with your government in terms of uh, the implementation and the engagement of civil society? How far is there an approach towards whole of government? Uh, what has been the approach so far on leaving no one behind? What are the financial mechanisms that exist? So, so this is designed to just give you a sort of an opening to set the scene around where things are in your country. Um, but we then encourage people to move on and look at more detail. And the if we go to the next slide now, we, we think it's essential that to do that, it has to be done in uh, an open, inclusive, participatory way. And I know that many of those on this call have themselves been helping to organize uh, meetings within your country, not just the national meeting, but also at the sub-national level where possible. So you have a number of different ways for civil society to give that feedback on where we see things are uh, and where the different ways um, might be possible for different people to, to engage and to provide their inputs, particularly where you have thematic networks that have specialist knowledge on water and sanitation or gender equality, uh, transport and so on. So the next slide, please. So once you've collected that evidence, what we're suggesting, and again, Sri Lanka did an excellent job on this, is to actually go through all 17 goals and give an actual score. So how far do you see progress has actually uh, happened under each of the goals? And we've suggested a score of one to five for each goal. Um, and the idea would be that that gives you a way of comparing uh, between different countries. So we can say, well, in certain countries, goal five may be uh, progressing, but goal 10 is not, and we can compare. Just, just if you, one second here, okay. Um, so then this gives you an example of how we suggest you do that. And of course it will be different in different countries, but you might then consider, for example, goal one, 
what has been um, the plan from the government? Have they started to implement this plan? Have they decentralized the plan? Is it already happening at the local level or provincial level? Uh, what evidence base have they got in terms of official statistics? Uh, has civil society been involved in actually setting out the priorities? Or are there any other additional uh, elements that you think are missing and that you think need to be included going forward? And finally, how would you assess uh, the effects of how this goal links to other goals? So that inter interlinkages um, gives you a chance to, to think about how one goal has an impact on others. And then finally, if, if possible, we suggest having a score. Sorry, just the, the end of that last slide. We suggest having a score of one to five so we can then visualize progress on each of the goals on a one to five basis so you could create uh, a bubble diagram or something to actually give you an impression of how far progress has gone so then to my final slide once you've done that process and again i know that many of you are already in the middle of doing this right now so i hope this is still useful for you as you plan ahead and as you hopefully uh, are able to have at least virtual meetings over the coming weeks we suggest then having a final consultation with your members and with wider civil society to actually validate um, the findings and, and the approximate scoring that you've given for each of the goals so that when you go to government, you can say, well, this is something that's been built uh, in, a, in a collaborative way and that different civil society partners have all been uh, playing their part and you can then use it for your advocacy at the national level. So I think that's pretty much all I had uh, to cover. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, that's given some impressions. I'm sorry that I've had to uh, be a little bit faster than I might be, but uh, I'm, I'm just uh, juggling as, uh, as I said before, and I'm very happy to uh, come back even if we don't have um, questions right now, but later on, uh, if uh, I'll, I'll try to log back on in, a, in another few minutes. Thanks, Deirdre. Thanks very much. Um, very much, Ollie. Um, that was a really great, very precise um, uh, input, and thank you for the for covering particularly the people scorecard, which I know A4SD has put a lot of work into. And just to say that the four uh, global networks that are involved in organising this webinar today, part of our uh, role really in supporting our members is in developing. Uh, useful tools, resources, materials, and so on. So if you go to any of our websites, you'll be able to find these. And I know the People's Scorecard is a, on Action for Sustainable Development's website and really a very useful tool if you're working at the national level on SDG implementation. So I'd like to move then from the global level, maybe to more the overview that, that um, Ollie has provided, to the national level, because I know that many of the um, civil society organizations who were represented on this call today are looking very much at the VNR process, the voluntary national review process, which is being organized by their government. And really for civil society, there have been many challenges in trying to engage effectively with the VNR process. And I suppose the recent COVID-19 pandemic only complicates the process of trying to engage effectively. So I'd like to turn to uh, Adriana Aralika, who is with SLOGA, the Slovenian National Platform and member of FORUS, and ask Adriana please to do a short presentation. Again, Adriana, if you can do it within eight minutes, we'd be very grateful, just to give us an idea of what's happening on SDG implementation in Slovenia at present and how SLOGA has tried to engage with the, the official VNR process. So over to you, Adriana. Thanks a lot and hello everyone. And of course, many thanks to the organizers for this opportunity. As uh, it has been already said, I will present our national context of how the Slovenian civil society is engaged in the implementation and monitoring of the SDGs with special focus on this year's VNR. So as said, I work with SLOGA, a national NGO platform bringing together about 40 Slovenian NGOs which are active in the field of international development, cooperation, humanitarian aid and global education. And of course, we are a member organization of FOROS. And as you can imagine, the SDGs are at the heart of our work. As the Secretariat, we mainly focus on advocacy, awareness raising, information provision, and capacity building activities, while member, our member organizations significantly contribute to implementation of the SDGs 
through development cooperation projects implemented in the partner countries, but also through awareness raising activities on national and European level, uh, since the SDGs are also strongly embedded in the global education or global citizenship education activities. At the first glance, in terms of performance in the SDGs, Slovenia is performing well. According to the SDG index, Slovenia ranks high on the 12th position uh, compared to the 8th place uh, in 2018. Our best performance is assessed in eradicating extreme poverty and access to clean energy resources, while challenges have been identified in the field of measures aimed at eliminating hunger, ensuring sustainable production and consumption, as well as measures to combat the, the effects of climate change and conserving the sea resources. Implementation of the 2030 Agenda in terms of institutional setting is coordinated by the Government Office for Development and European Cohesion Policy, with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs responsible for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda within the foreign policy domain. Slovenia has been an official development assistance donor country since 2004, and in 2018, funds earmarked for international development cooperation amounted to 0.16 gross national income. 65% of Slovenian development cooperation is allocated as multilateral development aid and only 35% as bilateral aid. So clearly we are lagging well behind the target of allocating 0.33 GNI for ODA until, until 2030 with a persistent lack of political will. In general, Slovenian development NGOs assess that the 2030 agenda is still not sufficiently embedded within various line ministries and also NGOs. And the issues are unfortunately still addressed in silos like manner. And here, hence, we're all the time advocating for strengthening the multi stakeholder partnership and approach to advance the global goals. Of course, now the million dollar questions are the implications, both short term, mid term, long term, of the COVID 19 outbreak. In addition, we have had a government change at the same time with the COVID-19 outbreak in Slovenia. So at the national level, significant budget cuts are expected, already manifesting in budget cuts in public funding for the NGOs, but also worrisome instances of pressure on NGOs and shrinking civil society space. So if I continue with the VNR process, so next slide, please. Um, as said, Slovenia is this year submitting its, its second VNR. The first one was drafted in 2017. The government body already started the preparation of its VNR already in the fall of 2019, so last year, through an inclusive and open process with engagement of various stakeholders. And in addition to receiving inputs from line ministries and governmental bodies, um, the gov government office for development in European cohesion policy decided to develop this VNR within a more inclusive process. And uh, we have been consulted already during the planning phase. Regional multi-stakeholder consultations with local and regional level stakeholders have been implemented through a partnership between the government office and us. And the government office also planned to organize thematic workshops, but on, unfortunately managed to hold only one prior to the COVID-19 outbreak. So recommendations have been developed during all these consultation events and workshops to be included in the VNR and currently we are compiling the NGO recommendations for the VNR. In addition, this year a civil society report will be drafted with the support of Foros. So maybe to outline the, the process that we took to draft, this, this will be the first civil society report, was that as a baseline activity, we conducted the background analysis and mapping of stake, stakeholders. The background analysis also provided an overview of available tools and resources for NGOs, which were later adapted to our national context and of course our resources. And based on the mapping, a working group has been con uh, established of consultants who are contributing to development of the alternative report method methodology. And it brings together different NGO uh, representatives with strong references in advocacy, research, monitoring, and of course, civil society dialogue. And in many discussions, the question whether to assume a whole of society or civil society approach arose. 
the as we know well the 2030 agenda encourages the whole of society approach in planning implementation and monitoring of the sdgs and uh, in many discussions about the stakeholder engagement in this uh, spotlight report the working group has identified that there are some governmental but independent or monitoring bodies such as the human rights ombudsman the advocate of the principle of equality Com commission for the prevention of corruption but also of course the academia are important potential allies especially from the viewpoint of strengthening the ownership of ag over agenda on national level and while it has been recognized that the uh, whole of society approach is very important we decided since this are this is our first civil society report to utilize the civil society approach and focus the report on the role of civil society in planning implementation and monitoring of specific sdgs and its targets um, in Slovenia, various so-called thematic networks, uh, meaning networks bringing together NGOs working on specific issues, SLOGA being one of them. Um, so those thematic networks are active and have established a regular coordination. And therefore, those networks and NGO alliances are a valuable resource also to utilize for stakeholder engagement and outreach activities in the process of drafting of this report. Uh, of course, with the purpose and the goal to ensure a representativeness of issues that will be addressed in the report. And in general, of course, we also hope that this spotlight report will contribute towards strengthening of the national 2030 coalition. And we strongly believe that broad civil society ownership of the SDGs will contribute also to stronger monitoring capacities of SDGs. So for now, this is all from um, my point. I'll be happy to respond to any questions on or, or comments later. And thanks again. Thank you very much, Adriana. And thanks for being so much keeping to time um, and for covering a wide range of issues. Thanks for mentioning. I mean, you mentioned the whole issue of financing for development and ODA. You mentioned civic space, a very relevant issue, and also um, interesting uh, examples of inclusive consultation processes that are happening in Slovenia, the importance of the civil society report and civil society coming together in various kinds of thematic and cross-sectorial networks and partnerships. So thanks for all of that, Adriana. And I suppose following directly on from your presentation, I'd like to call on John Romano, who's the coordinator of the TAP network, which is another global network, Transparency, Accountability and Participation Network, um, which has done a lot of work, not just on engaging with VNORs. I mean, a lot of, of um, NGOs focus on the build up to the presentation of the VNORs um, at the high level political forum. But the TAP network has particularly identified the follow up process once the VNOR has been presented in New York and commitments often made by governments, the whole um, follow-up process and trying to ensure that governments actually are held accountable for the commitments that they have made. So John, I'd like to hand over to you and ask you to, again, um, stick to the eight minutes. So um, over to you, John. Great. Yeah, thanks a lot, Deirdre. Um, yeah, I mean, as Deirdre mentioned, uh, yeah, the TAP network, you, we've been focusing a lot on, yes, the VNR process, uh, like many uh, of us here. Uh, recognize the VNR process as a, a really great entry point, an opportunity to engage with government around the SDGs and particularly around monitoring and reporting, um, which is, uh, you know, I think in, in pre-COVID-19 times, I think uh, in many ways those entry points were, were very good um, in many countries. We know obviously that in, in some countries it was uh, severely lacking with shrinking civic space. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, now more than ever, I think particularly with uh, the current context, I think that the post VNR follow up and uh, getting governments to commit to doing more uh, around the SDGs, I think is just as important, if not more important than ever. Um, you know, when we're talking about responding to the crisis and uh, rebuilding and strengthening resiliency, I think all of the SDGs um, come into play, um, I think, each and every one of us that work on specific issues and specific SDG issues uh, can see themselves impacted by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, and I think in many ways, 
uh, are seeing, uh, you know, how this impacts the SDG space, but also how the SDG space can impact, um, you know, going forward, the long-term prospects of, of building and strengthening resiliency um, to, to prevent uh, crises like this from happening in the future. Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, even before, yeah, even before this, we had focused a lot on the post-VNR process, as Deirdre had mentioned. It's making sure that governments don't see the VNR proce uh, process simply as an opportunity to report on progress, um, as a reporting obligation. Uh, what we really want to see governments do is not just, you know, report on what they've done and what they've achieved uh, up to that point uh, in the report, but we want governments to ultimately commit to doing more. I mean, I think that's ultimately what we're, we're hoping for governments to do, all of our governments to do in any case. Um, the SDGs should just be seen as a baseline of, of, this is the bare minimum that we want to achieve. Uh, ideally, governments should commit to doing more and, and be more specific about how they're going to implement uh, and contextualize SDGs um, in, in their own country. And civil society has a big role uh, to play. So, uh, you know, I think we often see the VNR process as our, our main entry point, but I think we also need to think about how we engage with governments in the mainstreaming of the SDGs process or the implementation process uh, as well. Uh, one thing that we are currently working on uh, with UNDP uh, at the moment is a resource guide uh, that will look at um, what needs to happen after VNR report is presented, um, particularly in the context of, of SDG 16, which is um, an issue um, or a set of issues that we work on closely as the TAP network. Uh, we're looking for uh, case studies. We're looking for inputs uh, into this uh, report, which will launch in the fall. Uh, and so you can see uh, a link there uh, in the slide uh, to provide some inputs. I mean, what we're really looking for is for this to showcase what's been done before, maybe what has worked, maybe what hasn't worked. Uh, this is really an opportunity, I think, for, for us to learn from one another to see what we can do better going forward to ensure that the post-VNR process is just as relevant and meaningful as the VNR process um, in many countries. Uh, I won't talk uh, too much about spotlight reporting because uh, a lot's been said about it already, uh, but I do think that, um, you know, particularly in the COVID-19 context, I do think that, uh, you know, from what we're hearing from, from a lot of our partners is that, uh, again, it's about, you know, I think we're going to need to make our issues relevant to the COVID-19 uh, response. I mean, we know that many of these SDGs are interlinked, obviously, with one another. Uh, and so I think it's, it's uh, it, I think what we're going to see more of in, in the future, uh, maybe over the next couple of years even, is uh, a focus on uh, our government's response to the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and I think that uh, includes a lot of things. I mean, it doesn't just include, you know, the institutional capacity and response from our government, but I think also related to uh, things like shrinking civic space and human rights uh, abuses and, and increasing marginalization of civil society that we're seeing. Um, a lot of governments use this as an excuse uh, to not just not consult with civil society, especially in the VNR processes that are ongoing right now. We're seeing the space shrink um, uh, mainly because you know governments can now use the excuse that uh, we can't host meetings anymore because of social distancing guidelines. But I don't think that we should allow governments to use that as an excuse uh, for not consulting still uh, in the VNR process. Uh, and I think a spotlight report is a great way uh, to actually synthesize and bring together some of those, uh, the inputs from civil society in a particular context and present those to the government. It's a great way to bring everything together and present it in a, in a way that, um, uh, you know, hopefully the government uh, can take up those, those inputs a little bit easier, particularly in, uh, you know, the context of today with, with social distancing guidelines. Um, we have a lot more um, uh, resources related to spotlight reporting, including guidance on how to uh, put a spotlight report together in our SDG accountability handbook, and you can find it uh, very easily. It's just uh, sdgaccountability.org. Uh, next slide, please. And so related to all of this, uh, you know, one of the things that, that we, you know, the, the focus of all of this, the post-VNR process and the spotlight reporting process and engaging in the VNR process, 
uh, is really with an aim towards accountability. You know, for civil society, that is a, a primary role for us to play um, around the SDGs. Um, and particularly in a, in a COVID-19 context is, is holding our governments accountable. Uh, and so one of the things that we uh, launched uh, and, and will look to launch uh, later this year is what we call uh, a campaign for a decade of accountability for the SDGs. So this is very much um, a multi-stakeholder campaign uh, and it's very much complementary we see uh, to the decade of action uh, committed by member states at the SDG summit last year. Uh, and really the intention of this, uh, this campaign, um, particularly in this initial phase, is to really uh, consult with our partners, particularly at the national and local level, to say, you know, where are some of those challenges that we're facing um, to hold our governments accountable? Where do we need further work and support um, to enhance accountability in, in different contexts? Uh, and so one of the things that we'll do uh, and we'll launch uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks here uh, is we'll do a survey, a consultation uh, with many of you. We would love to have inputs uh, to get your thoughts and perceptions about how accountability um, is in your context and how to improve it. Uh, and all of this will feed into a first of its kind uh, SDG accountability report, which we'll look to launch in the fall as well, uh, which will really look to unpack where those issues are, where are the key touch points, where do we need to improve on going forward, and then how do we mobilize to enhance and support some of those, those issues going forward. Uh, and so it's very easy to find uh, more information. We'll have much more information um, in the coming weeks ahead for you to all engage with. So we really look forward to, to working with all of you and to hearing from all of you. Uh, so it's very easy to find more information uh, going forward. You can sign up to um, find more information and keep up to date. Uh, it's just sdgaccountability.org slash decade. Uh, and also we're grateful to um, for us and Together 2030 and, and GCAP for, for leading the core group of this and then uh, a much wider advisor group of different uh, stakeholder groups uh, represented. So very much looking forward to engage on, on all of these fronts um, going forward with, with all of you. Thanks, Victor. Great, John, thanks very much. And maybe just to say quickly that Forrest is very happy to be a member of the core group of this a very timely campaign. So it's really um, been spearheaded by the TAP network, which is the campaign for a decade of accountability for the SDGs. It's a broad partnership. And as John said, the advisory group, um, which is a wider group, is made up of stakeholders from very different uh, backgrounds and sectors. And I think that's really going to help the campaign to be um, much more effective. And this is something that civil society is looking at more and more, how to enter into strategic partnerships with um, other sectors so that we actually increase our impact um, in terms of, of SDG implementation. So thanks, John. I'd like to, to move now to our next speaker, who's just Jasna Mohan Singh. She is the regional coordinator of um, the Asia Development Alliance. That's a regional member of FORUS. And uh, Justin is going to talk to us today about the very important regional level um, in terms of SDG implementation. And the title of her presentation today is Asia, Asia Pacific Engagement in the Regional Mechanism. So over to you, Justin. eight minutes. Thanks. Thank you, Deirdre. Um, so uh, I'm going to speak on Asia Pacific uh, engagement in the regional mechanism. And um, so the, basically in Asia and Pacific, the mechanism is very strong and we have, we worked uh, through the uh, Asia Pacific uh, regional mechanism, CSO mechanism, APRCM, which is a very strong uh, body and which was basically uh, founded way back in 2013. Um, but uh, uh, it was formally, it, it became very formal in 2016. And uh, this has already been in full operation then, since then. And uh, so the regional coordination mechanism has uh, uh, grown to include um, uh, 18 constituencies. Uh, we have women, children and youth, NGOs, indigenous people, local authorities, farmers, science and technologies, and SMEs, trade unions and workers, older groups, persons with disabilities, fisher folks, urban poor, migrants, LGBTIQ, people living with and affected by HIV, people affected by conflict, disaster, and Dalits. Um, and then there are five sub-regional representations uh, from Central Asia, East Asia, Pacific, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. And um, uh, as uh, it's, it's been, uh, I mean, uh, we saw in 2020, there was no physical meeting 
uh, happened uh, uh, we every year we have uh, asia pacific uh, uh, forum on sustainable development happening in bangkok but this year it has to be postponed first and but we have heard that's now cancelled and uh, so uh, uh, but instead of there there has been a series of online work this year uh, that started from uh, 24th of march until uh, until 8th of april 23rd, 24th march uh, meeting was basically on bnr engagement uh, but uh, sadly there was no uh, engagement with the csos uh, uh, which was uh, suddenly um, definitely we, we missed on that uh, because it was not solicited meeting and then uh, from uh, 30th of march they started the series of meetings um, although there have been uh, um, uh, that the meeting basically it draw it uh, it highlighted on the good practices in terms of ensuring wide participation for future online engagement. Um, what we have seen that uh, uh, this this meeting actually provided a very very good uh, uh, good 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 platform for engagement of the CSOs. Instead, um, as we discussed that in um, uh, that there was no CSO engagement on twenty fourth meeting that happened on BNR, but later uh, there was a good engagement BNR, uh, and we also found. Uh, our space, uh, we were able to give our uh, suggestion and input in, into the formal uh, meetings. Uh, it was also said some of the CSOs also believe and some of the stakeholders believe that we were able to give our views mostly because the, there was a very little uh, presence from the government side. Apart from that, uh, but, but the fact is that we were able to give our inputs and we, we, we look forward to seeing our inputs reflected in the formal uh, formal report that comes from the from the uh, from uh, uh, APFSD uh, statement uh, later this year. So uh, we have seen, uh, you know, uh, in Asian Pacific, there are certain things that I wanted to basically highlight before going to the next slide. Is um, we also have this year we have the you know Asia and Pacific SDG Progress Report 2019 is out, and we saw that the, there was a Asian Pacific. Um, uh, they have they, it says that we will the region will not achieve any of the 17 sdgs by 2030 because if the region remains on its current uh, trajectory uh, and the, this report also says that the uh, some of the goals like goal one on poverty on goal four education lifelong learning and to deliverable affordable and clean energy goal seven and then goal uh, water and sanitation goal six and then uh, goal eight on economic growth then uh, goal uh, uh, climate change, combating climate change, goal 13 and goal 16 um, are some of the areas of the uh, goals that is very hard to achieve. And because uh, it's been uh, said that there are lack of data, lack of um, uh, disaggregated data. So uh, these are goals which have been said that, uh, you know, it's very difficult for uh, these goals to be achieved until, and then we have now COVID has happened. So everything is has put on hold. Um, one of the important things that we have also noticed that none of the VNRs since 2017 discusses on the shrinking civic space. So, uh, and somehow the, the, the VNRs are keeping silent on that and civil society, we have been speaking a lot on that, but uh, they are yet to be found, uh, they are yet to find a space in the formal VNR process. So I think we really need to do advocacy on that. Uh, some of the good practices that we saw that uh, in 2017, for example, in India, the government of India did not engage with the stakeholder, when it, uh, especially in New York. I mean, there were state, multi-stakeholder consultations that happened in India, uh, but there was no formal uh, incorporation of CSO's input in the that reflected in the VNR. But in 2020 VNR, the government of India uh, is making uh, efforts and uh, they, uh, the they also solicited inputs from the VA, uh, from the CSOs. We have Badana Tora Bhiyan, which is the SDGs of uh, network, uh, biggest SDGs network in India, and that has been involved um, uh, very uh, actively with the government, and they have provided the inputs. Um, and they are also uh, highlighting some of the vulnerable population group include children, adolescents, and youth, women, elderly, Dalits, Adivasis, nomadic tribe, um, then the bonded labor and victim of human trafficking, LGBTIQ group, farmers, migrants, and urban poor people with disabilities, people living with HIV, religious minorities, refugees in Northeast regions, these all have found the mention. But again, we are yet to see how they are being uh, reflected in the formal VNR process. Um, we have also seen some uh, uh, practices, I tried to find out from, uh, from Nepal, which is again presenting 
we are for, for the second time so uh, in nepal also the civil society believe that uh, this time the engagement is much more wider than the what it used to be in the la last time and uh, this time uh, they are uh, they are uh, focusing on all the goals including the civil society which is again a good sign so but we'll see how the report comes and how their views are reflected so that was uh, part one of my uh, of my presentation another i would also try to say something on the impact of covid uh, so we discussed the shrinking civic space uh, we have seen in most of the countries in, uh, in asia there uh, the civil society is uh, being engaged with the government especially in the but mostly in the service delivery mechanism there are many many areas which is uh, which is not being discussed for example we saw one of the biggest and notorious migration in asia in especially in india that happened just post covid when the government suddenly announced the lockdown so there are millions of people who are who are abundant they are yet to reach home many people try to walk down to their villages to their native places they walk from hundreds and thousands of kilometers some of them died you know so uh, there are lots of issues that needs to be tackled and that needs to be thought on because you know there are civil society that's been working and we have tried to uh, kind of try to do mapping of the civil society contribution in the whole covid process and uh, in different countries and uh, we are trying to see how the civil society is trying to work with the uh, trying to help the people uh, by with working or not working with the government uh, civil society they have come up with various statements and uh, just a couple of weeks ago we had a meeting in uh, south asia uh, aprsm so we also discussed we are trying to come up with a statement on the civil society that demands and in the same uh, and we are uh, so so basically there are three areas that we'd like to highlight that uh, you know covid uh, there are economic uh, uh, economic uh, um, part then uh, social and the environmental um, uh, issues how they are how it's being how it's affecting the uh, the the entire uh, covid situation um, can we go to the last to last slide please um, great and just you'll need to finish up in a, in a minute uh... Just not, thanks very much. Okay, I just finish it, and uh, so we see that um, uh, basically in what uh, uh, some of the important points that I would just like to highlight here is that um, you know uh, we see that in Asia and Pacific uh, there are four hundred million lives. Um, you know, the, the, the four hundred million live on one point nine dollars per day. There are eight hundred people living below poverty line. One point five billion have no access to improved. Sanitation, one billion work in vulnerable areas, sixty percent without any social protection coverage. So some of those, are, and then we also see there is an increase in, you know, gender-based violence in different parts of the world. And Asia is also one of those, uh, you know, we we um, this is one of those areas where we want to highlight. We also wanted to uh, establish a universal health care, and uh, South Asia, especially one of those very conflicted zone, and so we are. We are it's also reflecting in our statement then how the government should uh, minimize the uh, the expenditure on military and they should increase uh, on health coverage on health infrastructure and, and education and uh, digital connectivity is also a very important social uh, important tool especially in the social distancing uh, possible without uh, so how so there is a need to invest on uh, you know on digital initiative uh, in environment, we see that uh, you know we environment has got a very breather, and uh, we during the lockdown we see that uh, um, there you see a lot of uh, news coming from the especially in southern south, southern part of Asia. We see clean sky, we see uh, bird, we hear bird chirping, but at the same time, you know there's substantial substantive reduction in the carbon carbon dioxide and nitrogen dioxide emission, the reduction in air pollution, a low demand for energy commodities. However, we need to rebuild that, uh, rebuild on that, and uh, there are uh, there are issues that that talks about, you know, um, uh, you know, um, slowdown of aviation and other things. But I think it's also important for us to think, uh, you know, what do we want to give, uh, what do we want to prefer? It should be uh, giving boost to the aviation or bigger industries, or to to give a breather to the nature. So right. lots of uh, kind of things so coming. Up. And just the last point uh, in ADA, uh, we are trying to, at the regional level. We are trying to do a lot of advocacy. We are collecting some civil society statements, and we are uh, we are we have collected a lot of uh, country level case study, and uh, we will plan to consolidate all of them, and we'll come up with a advocacy paper very soon. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Justin. I appreciate you you sticking to time, and uh, thank you for covering so much in your presentation. And obviously, you had a lot to cover, but particularly to point out that. I think the uh, regional civil society engagement mechanism in Asia Pacific is really a leader, I think, in terms of showing other regions how it can be done. 
And it's quite challenging for civil society to try to organize itself at a regional level and to ensure representativeness and inclusivity and so on. And you mentioned digital connectivity as well. I think that's something we're going to have to really push for as civil society, because given the impact of the COVID pandemic on uh, meetings such as the regional sustainable development forums, which lot, many of which have been uh, deferred or cancelled um, this year, and also the high level political forum itself, which is supposed to be taking place in July. We're not sure um, what's going to happen with that yet, but this issue of digital connectivity and involving civil society fully in any virtual um, meetings and processes that are held is very important. So thanks for covering that uh, just now. And I'd like to hand over now to our next speaker, who's going to be our last speaker today, and that's Arellis Bellarini from Together 2030. And Arellis is based in New York, very much keeps an eye on what's happening at UN system level, but also um, the high level political forum. And we'll look um, particularly at this now, or we'll cover it particularly in her presentation today. So Arellis, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deidre, and hello, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us today. So I want to very briefly speak to you, uh, as Deidre was saying, about uh, what's coming up with the High Level Political Forum. I think we are all wondering uh, what, is, what is going to happen. So I want to run you through it a little bit uh, and, uh, and, and inform you, uh, give you more information about that. So first of all, I'd like to, to make a, a recap. Uh, as, as you know, we, the HLPF 2020 has a focus uh, and a specific theme. And uh, I'm not going to read it there, but uh, I'm sure that you are all familiar with the fact that uh, the decade of action and delivery uh, is uh, the main thrust of uh, HLPF 2020. And uh, it's a structure as usually um, around two segments, the thematic segment and also the, the, the VNR segment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the program, which you can find online, uh, has, uh, is built on the six entry points of the Global Sustainable Development Report. Uh, so that's the thematic review that is going to be done. Each of the entry points has a set of SDGs aligned to, to the headline of the entry point. And uh, again, I'm not going to read them, as I'm sure that you are familiar with. Uh, but uh, since these PowerPoints are going to, to be shared, uh, you will be able to read them uh, quietly, as uh, one of you suggested in the, in the chat. Next slide, please. If we go, to, if we go back to January, <laughs> this is how the HLPF was looking like um, before we got into the, the global health emergency uh, with uh, the major impact that is having in in our lives. Um, this is the global process uh, timeline that had been set up. There were a regional, set, uh, regional forums that were going to take place, uh, the thematic expert group meetings, um, the negotiations of a ministerial declaration uh, that is uh, usually adopted during the HLPF, um, the discussion on, uh, on the next cycle of HLPF, which would be included in as part of the overall HLPF review. Uh, and in the midst of all of that civil society participation along all of that, all of that process. Uh, and together with it all, all the uh, preparations about uh, civil society registration, which is always a, a, a bit of a challenge and uh, the participation in itself uh, at the high level political forum in July. Next slide, please. Um, all of that uh, has changed, as I was uh, saying, uh, and here I want to give you a little bit of a view of, uh, of where we are uh, in the midst of uh, so much uncertainty at this point. So, so far what we have is that the ministerial declaration, which is a very important piece uh, of the HLPF, uh, is undergoing consultations. There is a draft outline and a zero draft. It's uh, has been promised for mid-May. All of those consultations have been taking place virtually. And um, I, must, I must note that civil society is not participating in those consultations, uh, although we are having conversations with the co-chairs uh, of, the, of the process. Um, another thing that's been happening is that DESA has opened applications for exhibitions 
for side events and for participation in special events. Um, so all of the preparations going on right now is as if HLPF is going to take place uh, on site here in New York uh, in a little bit of business as usual modality. So that's why DESA is opening up applications. Um, they are convening a series of virtual consultations as, they, as they've done in the past on thematic review. Um, major groups and other stakeholders are, sub are submitting uh, executive summaries of uh, position papers and VNR countries should be submitting their key messages um, sometime next week. Um, so that's everything that is happening so far. Uh, as you can see, a lot is more on if the HRPF is going to take place um, uh, physically in, in New York. However, there is uh, somehow uh, a little bit of uh, forecast into what's going to happen based on what has been happening in, uh, in all other meetings here at the, at the UN. Uh, meetings, for example, like this uh, Commission on Status of Women, meetings like the Forum on Financing for Development, and, and other important meetings. Um, so, so far, uh, we will say, we, would, we can affirm that the ECOSOC Bureau has not made a decision yet. So we don't know whether it will take place or what, what will happen. Uh, some of the options that the Bureau has and that they will be decided upon, it's uh, that they may, uh, they may have um, a decision related to the decisions that they have adopted uh, to the CSW and Financing for Development Forum. So such options could be on-site uh, meeting, only with New York-based participants, or a virtual meeting of HLPF, but significantly scaled down. Um, it is estimated that if those options, uh, particularly the virtual one, um, is adopted, then we would have uh, BNR's uh, countries presenting their reports uh, virtually. Uh, so far, BNR countries have not a step away from presenting VNRs. They are indicating to DESA that they are, uh, all, uh, that their preparations were almost completed when this emergency started and that they are well advanced in their processes. And uh, only two uh, VNR countries canceled their participation. So we've gone down from 51 to 49. So it's not really uh, a major thing. Uh, in the context of a virtual HLPF, I must say, the big question is civil society engagement in a virtual, in a virtual setup. So um, that hasn't been going well here in New York uh, in the sense that we have not been allowed into the consultations and any other uh, member states uh, meetings. Um, like I said, we have had conversations with the co-facilitators but that has been only with the two co-facilitators or only with DESA, but in the context of the uh, virtual calls that are convened between member states, uh, we have not been invited. So here is a little bit of a call for us to advocate. Uh, we need to uh, really make a, str a strong drive to ensure that we are going to be um, participating in a virtual in a virtual setup. So I'm going to, to leave that message there. Um, the other message that I would like to leave with you is that uh, because the um, events, side events is open for submission, uh, I would encourage you to submit your side events, uh, but with the mindset that that side event may be taking place uh, virtually. Next slide, please. So before concluding, I just want to say a little word about HLPF review. Uh, the draft, uh, there is a draft resolution right now to actually postpone the review to the 75th session, which is going to be opening in the September uh, 2021. Uh, so that means that all the process that was, that had uh, started somewhat uh, here, uh, it's going to stop and it's going to be folded until uh, next year. 
Uh, in addition, um, it's uh, uh, the draft resolution that I was referring to addresses uh, immediate provisions on themes for HLPF for an entire cycle. So from 2021 to 2023. And it also indicates the SDGs that are going to be reviewed. So the proposal right now includes the themes that you see there in the PowerPoint, human well-being and the SDGs for 2021, uh, achieving sustainable and just economics and promoting sustainable development for 2022, and uh, universal access to energy in harmony with nature for 2023. Next slide, please. Aligned with those, with those themes, uh, each of the themes, uh, they have uh, uh, a set of goals that are going to be reviewed. And as you can see, uh, for each of the year, uh, the number of goals to be reviewed, it's uh, bigger than what we had in the first cycle. And some, some goals, like five, uh, goal uh, five, goal 16, and goal 17, would be reviewed the th during the three years. Uh, so that is so far the, the proposal. Evidently, uh, a number of us from civil society think that uh, there are uh, one or two additional goals that should be reviewed every year to complement it and to make it much more integrated and to bring forward uh, the transformative aspects of the, of, the, of the SDGs. So this is what we wanted to share with you and for you to have a little bit of an idea uh, from the follow-up that we, that we do uh, from the different streams that, that we are working on um, from our various platforms. Next slide, please. Oh, that's the last one. So thank you so much. And I hope I kept uh, to the time, Deidre. Thank you so much. You did, Aurelis. Thanks very much and still managed to cover an awful lot. So thanks for summarising there. Um, firstly, the fact that um, member states seem to be approaching the high level political forum this year as though it's going to happen. So um, you're saying there's a number of possibilities, either a smaller um, scale down kind of version of the high level political forum might take place in New York, but that will obviously be limited probably to the participation of people who actually attend in New York, which will probably be a very limited number or alternatively virtual uh, high level political uh, forum, which would be, you know, uh, on di digitally um, people will be participating. But again, it's far from certain that civil society will be included in that. And so you're really encouraging us all to push as strongly as we can for that kind of participation in the high level political forum this year. And obviously each of the member organizations who are represented on this call can push with their own governments to try to make sure that um, civil society is represented in virtual uh, meetings if they, they take place or a virtual high level political forum if it takes place. I think you're also telling us that the um, opening or the opportunity to submit side events has been advertised by the high level political forum. And so we should, or by UN ECOSOC, we should actually be submitting those now. I think the deadline was the 4th of May, but they've extended that. So it should be possible to continue submitting um, side events. And then I think the last thing you've told us, uh, Arellis, is that the high level political forum review process, which was supposed to be taking place, it had, you know, uh, been activated last year and was running into this year, that in fact, it's not going, the review is not going to take place until next year properly. And so even though that's disappointing, it does leave more opportunity for civil society to advocate for the kind of changes we want to see to the functioning of the overall um, HLPF system. And that also has implications for the regional system and the national level, the VNR process. So we should keep pushing that door. And we have included in the first chat box there at the beginning of the meeting, a link to for the Forest paper. Forest consulted widely with its members on a paper on the review of the high level political forum. But I know other organizations have done the same. And in fact, we came together, the four organizations who've um, organized this webinar and we produced a principles paper, which we um, presented during a side event at the high level political forum in 2019, really pushing for the kind of changes we wanted to see uh, to the high level political forum system. And, um, you know, one of those would have been um, to try to strengthen the regional level, but we had many others. So we would encourage everybody to look at um, the papers we've produced and to keep that advocacy going because uh, the process won't finish now until next year. So I'd like to thank all of our speakers really for some excellent and wide ranging um, overviews of their particular areas of interest. And what I'd like to do now is to open up 
to uh, the floor. I'd like to open up to anybody who's on the call here to um, have a discussion now based on both what our speakers have said, but any other points that you want to raise in terms of the whole issue of how to promote um, effective civil society engagement with SDG implementation, particularly in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. So um, I'm going to ask people to raise their hands. And I think I said to you already, if you go into the participants, um, click on the participants button at the bottom of your screen, and then you should see at the bottom of your, your screen again, um, uh, an option to raise hand. So you just click on that and you, your hand will be raised or alternatively write your question in the chat box. So is there anybody who has their hand raised at the moment? Um, one of my colleagues might let me know if there is anybody who'd like to make a comment or ask a question. Um, I see a hand up and it is Dali 10 Hova from CSPPS. So Dali, I will ask you to yeah, unmute yourself or maybe Arturo, could you unmute um, Dali? And yes, Dali, you're very welcome to make your point. Great, thanks very much. And uh, thank you to everyone for their presentations. I just wanted to ask a question to uh, Adriana from Sloga. If I understood correctly, um, it's an NGO coalition to the government's VNR, but in addition to... Um, Dali, just to say to you that your connection is poor, we... If, if I... Oh. Uh, Dali, just to say, can you repeat the question? We'll try, yeah. but your connection is very broken. And because we can't hear oh, you... I'm sorry. Dali, yeah. I'm going to ask you to put your question in the chat box because we're having difficulty hearing you. Could you do that? Could you write it into the chat box? Thank you. And while you're doing that, Dali, I'll go on to our next uh, raised hand, and that's from Marcella Brown. So, Dali, while you're writing your question in the chat box, Marcella, would you unmute yourself and make your input? Thanks. Hi, I am from Pampa 2030. It's an Argentinian platform. And we have members, uh, social, civil social organizations and union organizations members. And I want to share that Pampa 2030 is making six reports on issues related to SDG 1 and SDG 2 on poverty, SDG 10 on equality and social protection, SDG 4 or on education, SDG, SDG 8 on decent work, and at least says SDG 17 on inclusive alliances. And I think uh, very soon we can share with you the reports. That's all. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much, Marcella. Um, I see another hand up from Tatat. So Tatat, would you like to unmute yourself? and? Um, yes, uh, sure. So yeah, my name is Tata from Invid in Indonesia. So uh, I thank for to all the presenters for the presentations and I just want to make a little comments uh, regarding SDGs achievement, especially in Indonesia. So since the COVID-19 pandemic is now uh, yeah, happening all over the world and then we see that actually the SDGs achievement is kind of uh, backlash. There's potential that uh, in some, in many aspects, in many goals, it would be, uh, yeah, it's hard to achieve. It's even harder to achieve uh, than before the uh, pandemic. And in, regarding the civic space, also there's increasing threatening situations uh, here. Like for example, there's uh, uh, there's some activists which is very much critical to the government was being threatened, and then also. Uh, yeah, and, and that kind of things are really much happening, and 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 then also, I I am I myself very worried because uh, t today earlier in the, uh, this uh, today I heard the the, uh, the dialogue between the the government and also the head of provinces and uh, cities in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. uh, only some of them talk about the relations between the COVID nineteen pandemic and the sustainable development goals. What's on their mind is only how to increase, how after the 
crisis end, how to increase more investments and then also how to increase, how to boost the economic growth and so on. None of them really, uh, uh, very few of them talk about the uh, the relation between disaster management, sustainable development goals and so on. So yeah, it's really, uh, yeah, it's really worrying for me. So yeah, that's a bit comment from Indonesia. Thank you. Thanks, Tatat. And that is very worrying to hear these trends beginning to be um, obvious or becoming more obvious. So um, what we've done in Forest is we've set up a task force on COVID-19 and I'm sure other organisations, global and regional networks will be doing the same. So we're going to monitor very clearly the trends that are happening in different countries and different parts of the world and start to, to identify suitable uh, responses by civil society. So um, it's good to hear your, your, your feedback. Yeah. And um, we, as I say, we'll be gathering that from all of our members. So I'm going to just go to uh, Dali's um, question here in the chat box, and then I'm going to come back to Akmal and to Luvna, uh, who have their hands up uh, to speak uh, just after that. So Dali's question to Adriana from Sloga was um, that if you understood correctly, civil society contributed to the government's VNR and also wrote a civil society report. And he says, if I understood correctly, I'd like to ask why civil society chose to write its own report in addition to contributing to the government's one and how these two have complemented one another. So Adriana, I wonder, could I put that question to you from Dali? Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, so yes, indeed, the, the government invited us to, to participate in the VNR process, mostly by participating in the different events and consultations that have been taking place and also developing recommendations. And also this now we have been asked to contribute uh, with recommendations to the VNR report. But uh, so the recommendations are small part of the whole um, the whole report which in a significant part focuses on the the improvement or development in implementation of certain goals but the majority so the bulk of the the content was provided by the ministries and um, while of course we can complement it still we are mostly focusing on the recommendations part and uh, that's the reason why we also decided to uh, to produce a spotlight or civil society report which will deal more in depth with specific either issues goals or targets and the spotlight report will provide us also the opportunity to address those issues more in detail to provide maybe more also more practical examples um, or uh, practical information uh, how maybe some different policies which aren't aligned um, prevent of implementing the leaving no one behind principle or how different policies that aren't coherent affect uh, um, affect the the fact that we aren't progressing with the SDG implementation as we wanted. And um, so, yeah, that's the reason why we decided and we believe that the civil society report will, of course, on one hand, complement the government VNR, pinpointing the issues where we believe that we could do better, but also maybe highlighting some issues where we believe that we do well with the focus also or the yeah the focus on how the civil society is contributing to implementation of the goals so we want to have that as a key message throughout all the contributions of different ngos in the in the spotlight report and on the other hand it also sets a very good basis for the civil society advocacy efforts so more coordinated efforts of maybe of the 2030 national coalition towards the change that we want to see to ensure that the SDGs become a reality also on national level. Great, thanks Adriana. And um, I think what you're telling us here is that, um, you know, the writing of a civil society spotlight or shadow report is not incompatible with making a contribution also to the government's official VNR report, that the two can be complementary, but that, you know, the spotlight report allows civil society an opportunity maybe to cover issues that aren't covered in the VNR report or to point out, as you say, certain maybe incoherences or um, so on that are preventing the achievement of the SDGs. So thanks for that, Adriana. And I suppose the next person I think who had their hand up was Akmal Ali from Piango, which is the um, regional coalition in the Pacific. So Akmal, over to you. You need to unmute yourself. Hi, Nisam Bulavinaka. Greetings, everybody. It is 2.08 a.m. the 1st of May. So I 
and in the future. Um, uh, so thank you very much, Deidre. I think today's session was very informative and I love it. Um, I think Oli was great as well and uh, all the presenters and uh, of course, our regional partner, Ada, Dr. Joshna, as usual. So um, I think I, I would like to, I really don't have a question, but uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, having been involved in the SDGs myself, just to, I think, giving a little on the last question that was posed on why shadow reports are done by civil society. I will tell you, in case of the Pacific, uh, I will not talk about other countries. I think it's very important for civil society to do a shadow report. Why, number one, because many a times it has been seen that governments would only engage civil society in a tokenistic manner. Whereas SDGs, clearly goal 17.17 states that if SDGs are to be successful, it needs genuine partnership between government, civil society, private sector, and UN agencies. But we have seen time and again that this is not happening. And therefore, it is imperative on civil society as watchdogs of the people to be able to do that. As, as you know, very rightly described by one of our former ambassadors in Fiji, she once described that, she gave an example of a car. She said, the driver was the government while the engine was the private sector and civil society was the GPS. So we are the people, <laughs> we, we are organizations that actually direct or say, this is the way to go to your destination. And, uh, I, I, and, 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 um, and moving on, I think it's, it's very important that goal, the importance of goal 16 and 17 are really emphasized because it is, um, I, in my humble opinion, 1 to 15 is what can be done. How can be done is 16 and 17. How is the, the answer is in 16 and 17. But, but, and my last point being, I think after the COVID-19, the whole world is going to be different. Because remember, neither the civil society, governments, they were given certain indication. Today I was reading um, a, a Times article where governors about two years ago were informed that there might be an epidemic, a pandemic and you know states would have to be prepared and they were not prepared. But civil society, certainly we, we never anticipated something. You know, whereas um, the Spanish flu was a great example, uh, but you know we never took our cue from there. And I think it's 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 general it's 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 very important that we admit that. And and I think I've seen many uh, uh, zooms uh, or or you know webinars happening where people have accepted. But moving on to, uh, uh, I mean SDGs don't even cover pandemics. That's the most interesting thing. So what does this mean? For COVID-19 in our responses, when you know a pandemic was not even part of any, I mean, you know, when you actually do a postmodern of the SDGs, the goals, indicators, and targets, there is no pandemics mentioned. And today, the governments are trying to all they are trying to do is trying to address the issue of pandemics, and and I mean, you know, all the problems it's caused is actually. Uh, the success of SDGs, I mean, looks more impossible today than it was six months ago because economies are collapse, collapsing. Countries will go into recession. There is more poverty. I was reading one of these reports where I said uh, more than half of the global workers will lose their jobs. So achieving SDGs would become impossible. Uh, uh, and, and that means that we must come up with different ways of thinking and approach. And I will shut down there. Thank you very much, Deirdre. I think I spoke a lot. Akmal, thank you, but you deserve it. You're up at 2 a.m. in the morning in the Pacific, so you deserve a really good, strong intervention. And thank you for that. I mean, I do think you, you, the point you make about COVID and the impact it's going to have on SDG implementation is a very relevant one. But I think it's also important to remember that governments are already thinking forward planning and thinking about how to uh, as, as a, a joint document we contributed to recently that was spearheaded by A4SD, talked about building back better. So we have got to ensure that the efforts to promote economic recovery and to build back better 
after the COVID pandemic have this SDGs at their core. So, you know, I, I, I personally wouldn't be as, as um, pessimistic as you are, but I see exactly what you mean that, you know, the, there is a risk at the moment because of the huge economic impact of the pandemic that it may interfere with the implementation of the SDGs and we have to make sure that doesn't happen. Um, I'd like to just go on to, because there's a couple of other people who've indicated they'd like to ask a question. I'm going to go to the chat box first, and then I'm going to come back to Lubna, who I know has been waiting with his hand up. So um, in the chat box, we have a question from Annie Namala to everyone, which is, with COVID-19, it's all the more important to focus on the most vulnerable communities, whatever the content, reversing their situation is important. So I think that's a very valid point, um, Annie, and thanks for making that. Um, I'll go back to Lubna then and see whether Lubna has a question um, that he, he or she would like to make. So Lubna, over to you. Hello, everyone. Can I just uh, make an update on what we are trying to do in India? Sure. Just yeah. to, to, as, uh, although we can. Yeah. yeah. Jyotsna has already added certain points, but I'd still like to add, you know, some more points which I think sure. are quite relevant. So um, uh, back in, uh, because India is now, you know, presenting second uh, voluntary national review on sustainable development goals and uh, this uh, last time they did not last time it was 2017 when they did not actually engage with the civil society but this time they showed interest and it was not just with uh, you know civil society academia uh, academia think tanks but they engaged with the private sector as well as research and they're thinking of two kinds of outputs which is one is the main message as a written document and the other one is a video which they are you know uh, which they were parallelly making and in, uh, in our case, when it comes to the civil society, so they identified uh, some 16 uh, vulnerable communities, which include the Lits, Adivasis, elderly, youth and adolescents, children, women, LGBTQIA+, farmers, uh, bonded labor and victims of human trafficking, persons with disability, migrants and urban poor, people living with HIV AIDS, refugees, and there's one uh, region particularly, uh, a conflict region, which is Northeastern India, and one, two set standalone consultations we did on nomadic tribes and denotified tribes and religious minorities. So again, I would like to say here, because the people were quite keen in asking whether we should come up with a shadow report uh, as well or not. But in our case as well, uh, although we have you know, given them the detailed uh, re reports, but uh, the thing is that we are not really sure how much of it will go into, the, into their own report, maybe you know 10% at most or 15% at most. But uh, we do not, because uh, the, when, when it ca came to this thing that, you know, they are going to do, uh, take the inputs from all these civil society, uh, civil society groups. So what we did also was we did 16 national consultations. And apart from that, some 50 to 60 uh, uh, sub-national consultations. So in which around uh, 2,000 people and voices from community particularly were represented. So we do not want to lose on that. And that being the reason we're thinking of coming up with the civil society report as well as a major piece, because all of the you know our hard work of two, three, four months has gone into it. And we want to come up with, uh, with one parallel piece as well as a holistic piece. But uh, beyond that, because you know, if, when everybody is asking this question that, you know, uh, due to COVID, the situations are going to change. And we know that you know, it is going to change. So my question would be, are we still uh, going to look at SDGs and then, you know, vis-a-vis -vis COVID-19? Or is it uh, something else? Because now that, you know, uh, economic consequences are there, and now people are going to lose the jobs, lose the livelihoods. Mm -hmm. And it will be, you know, mental health trauma and, you know, depression-related cases and a lot yes. of, you know, other things that are going on. But domestic violence is quite on rise and everything. Sure. So are we going to have some parallel planning for the next 10 years? Or is it just that we are going to merge our planning with the SDGs? Great. Very good question, Lubna. Thanks very much. Now, I see that uh, Arhun has his hand up and I can see that one or two of our speakers want to get back in as well. So what I'm going to do is give Arhun the opportunity to make a point and then I'll go back to each of our speakers and ask them to make concluding remarks. Um, and sorry that we don't have more time, but we are drawing to the end of the call. And I think all the interventions so far have been very rich. So Arhun, over to you and uh, then I'll turn to our speakers. Okay, thank, thank you very much. This is Arjun from Nepal. I represent the NGO Federation of Nepal, it's a national coalition of 6,500 NGOs 6, NGO in Nepal. And uh, actually, what we are doing, I'll uh, share very uh, like in a short way. Like, we are doing like, uh, we are uh, organized already like this um, 16 plus forum and national SDG consultation and many more. But after 
due to this COVID-19, we started to monitoring the human rights situation across the country with uh, with uh, with jointly with the National Human Rights Commission and uh, Federation of Nepalese Journalists and Nepal Bar Association. It is a high level monitoring committee. We are doing um, like. Um, uh, human rights monitoring as well as uh, response to COVID and uh, some providing relief materials across the countries. And the second thing in terms of SDGs, like oh, it's now is after this COVID-19, we have to revise all our strategy and we are discussing with the National Planning Commission how we go uh, for the BNR or other these SDG processes and the government also revised their strategy. So we are engaging with uh, like the government. So how the government to develop the policy? Then we we work together with the government. And on behalf of NGO Federation of Nepal, we are uh, also the, um, preparing the uh, report, a spotlight report on civic space. So we are gathering data uh, across the countries and uh, also fact finding um, information. So these are the basic uh, information. And then my um, intervention that. Like there's a two critical issues in the, my country. One is the funding issues. Like there's a lot of issues now is the uh, funding after the COVID-19. So one uh, I think is a is a is a connected to the yeah. 17. And uh, and uh, the second issue. So I think this time we have to discuss about how we, we like about the to divide the targets and goals because. Yes. After COVID, there are other the issues and changes. So I would like to um, I would like to attention all like um, this present uh, present uh, presenters how we can like um, how we can revise the targets and indicators. So I okay. think that is my uh, my idea. Arun, thank you very much, and I'm sorry that the time is so tight, but thank you for making your points there. So I'm going to start with Ali Henman, then I'm going to go to John Romano, then to Justna, um, Arellis, and Adriana. So, Ali, over to you, maybe just to, to frame some responses to what you've heard. Thanks so much again, Deirdre, and thank you to everyone for uh, some incredible participation today. It's been a, a very helpful webinar. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanted to give two final observations based on quite a lot of the questions and the chat that I've seen there. The first one is on the uh, shadow reports or spotlight reports. Um, I think it's really important that we do have that independent civil society report. Um, it's important because it provides an accountability moment and it also provides an independent assessment. And that's really what the scorecard is designed to help you with so that you as civil society, as a coalition can do your own assessment and actually compare that with the government and hold government to account where you see the gaps. Because as we know from experience, it's unlikely governments are gonna highlight their own gaps. So I think it's important that we keep that uh, element there. The second point, my last point, is around the COVID response. And as Deirdre, as you mentioned, we have been helping to coordinate uh, a massive response by civil society, highlighting a number of key concerns around inequalities, around civic space, around gender, and around climate and environmental justice. And if you haven't had a chance yet to sign up to that, please do. We'll be taking that to the Secretary General of the UN next week, uh, and we'll be aiming to do quite a lot of public awareness raising and working with the media over the coming weeks so that we don't lose some of those gains that are embedded in the SDGs in the response and recovery to COVID. So look forward to carrying on to work with many of you on that. It's covidcitizenaction.org. It's a, it's a special web page that we've created specially for uh, that um, that statement. So please do sign up. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. And John Romano, over to you. Hi, John. Thanks a lot, Deirdre. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just a really quick point on spotlight reporting. Yeah. I mean, completely agree with everything that's been said on the importance um, for accountability and uh, sharing uh, our perspective of, of progress. Um, one thing just so I wanted to note is that uh, we uh, will launch a report uh, next week that we did with uh, in partnership with GIZ. Uh, it's a comparative analysis of spotlight reports and VNRs uh, on SDG 16 in particular, um, taking a look at the past, past two years worth of spotlight reports and VNRs. And I won't spoil um, much of the results for, of that comparative analysis, but I think one of the things that we found was that uh, the spotlight reports uh, that we analyzed uh, we're much more thorough and comprehensive on reporting on progress and some of the gaps, as Ali just mentioned, uh, and also looking at next steps and, and concrete commitments of what needs to happen going forward, um, especially compared to the VNR reports. Uh, the main challenge was that 
um, the different formats that uh, the spotlight reports came from. I mean, there were different approaches all across the board. So comparability um, amongst or uh, across reports was uh, a little bit difficult. So I think there needs to be a little bit further work on, on how we bring some of those methodologies together. Uh, and so we'll, we'll, we'll launch that report uh, next week. So for those of you that are interested, uh, we'll host a webinar in a couple of weeks to launch this report amongst other things. Uh, which we'll talk about in just a second. But yeah, just to, to respond to very quickly to uh, a question in the chat box around the uh, uh, implementation of SDG 16 and the importance for um, around the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I think what COVID-19 um, has done in, in a lot of ways is it's exposed some of the existing fractures within societies today, um, some of the inequalities that we find um, in societies today. So um, yeah, as we mentioned before, I think we need to think about how we build better, how we strengthen institutions, um, how those institutions and our governments protect human rights and fundamental freedoms and, and maintain peace and all of that's within SDG 16. Um, and uh, I think the SDG 16 could be a big part of ensuring that we're strengthening resiliency to protect and safeguard against um, the impact of these crises going forward. So um, with that, yeah, again, we'll, we'll host a, a webinar in a couple of weeks to talk about SDG 16 and COVID-19. How, uh, what are the uh, interlinkages? How can we use SDG 16 um, to strengthen resiliency beyond um, co the COVID-19 crisis? Um, and so for those of you that are interested, um, you can follow, uh, you can uh, join the network, um, keep up to date and join this webinar. Just um, find more information, uh, tapnetwork2030.org slash join. Uh, and we'll have much deeper conversations on that uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot, John. Very um, helpful information. Um, over to Justna then. Justna, do you have any concluding remarks you'd like to make? Um, thank you, Deirdre. Uh, yes, um, I very much agree with having the spotlight report and um, what we are doing in ADA, uh, we are trying to collect all the reports, civil society reports, and um, we are also trying to get, uh, you know, things from uh, Central Asia, which is not very much mainstreamed. So this year, there are two countries from civil, uh, Central Asia, there was Pakistan and Kyrgyzstan were presenting civil VNR, so we are trying to get in touch and we already have some report on civil society initiative. You know, so that's one thing, and we're also coming up with a report. With uh, we are working with APRCM and working on the uh, on the fact sheet of um, of the VNRs and how it has been in last four years, and um, uh, and also the one point that I wanted to highlight. You know, something very similar to what John said, but um, you know, share on the impact of COVID and the shrinking civic space. Uh, so goal 16, mm -hmm. I'm glad to see that goal 16 has been included in 21, 22, and 23, uh, three, which, is very, which is a very good news. I'm not sure that they have, trying to, they have tried to institutionalize goal 16, just like 17, but then they are going to be reviewed for next three years. So I think we have a lot of opportunities and I think COVID is a, uh, so I think it's very important for all of us to, 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 to work on you know, the role of civil society and the COVID is one of the disaster. We don't know how it goes in the future and there could be some other, other disaster pandemic. So I think it's very important for us the, how to engage with the government and other stakeholders. Uh, so I think coming up with some sort of ad boxy document, we have already signed a A4ST document citizenship, uh, citizenship report, a statement, but uh, I think we have need, to, need to come with some advocacy report and we can work together on a joint, joint advocacy. We can give you a lot of data from Asia and if you want, we can come up with a global report. A second thing I wanted to highlight is on the funding scenario, which has been all time to time it's been said, but you know, uh, this year we see the lot of work, a lot of physical events have been pushed to 21 or we don't know how it goes. So uh, how, the, the role of funding, I mean, in this scenario, uh, other, other, other donors of funding are going to accept uh, the no cost extension or some sort of more, or maybe some more assistance I think it's very important to discuss because I've been, we are discussing some of the donors and they're like, yeah, we'll see. But I think it's time to, to sit and talk with the funders and uh, to, to get more support. And uh, how, how do we manage some of the work? I mean, uh, through the, the digital activities, a lot of uh, physical activities, we, we are going to save a lot of money. So how it's going to be utilized next year. I think it's very important to discuss on that scenario. Thank you Great. so much. Thanks a lot, Justin. A very good yeah there yep and I think the funding and, and resourcing civil society during this particularly challenging time is an important one that we need to to also direct our advocacy towards. Um, can I ask Arellis please to come in and make any concluding remarks? Yes uh, thank, thank you I don't want to repeat what my colleagues have said I very much agree 
uh, with what has been expressed regarding the VNRs uh, in the spotlight in the spotlight reports. Um, I just would like to leave uh, uh, two thoughts here with uh, colleagues uh, participating uh, in this webinar. One is um, because of the highly likely virtual setting, uh, it is important that you start uh, engaging with your government uh, to push and uh, to influence them into inviting you to participate with them in the virtual setting. Uh, we do need to come uh, collectively into uh, pushing for our participation, regardless of whether it's on site or whether it's uh, uh, virtual. Um, that uh, will be will ensure that all the work that you are doing at national level in relation to the to the VNRs can also have the linkage to the global level, which is the moment uh, uh, at HLPF. Uh, the second thing I think that uh, that's important is uh, that uh, that we uh, really emphasize uh, the the gaps in the VNRs, and I think that's been done uh, very well. But uh, together with the with the gaps. Uh, to also have a conversation about what you really think about the entry points, how they relate to the to the SDGs, particularly to the transformative aspects of the 2030 agenda, uh, so that you can come to to HLPF either at virtual or 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 not, uh, with very specific thoughts to contribute and to influence for the next G GSDR but also uh, for this entire cycle of HLPF, because as you see in the, in the, program, in the draft resolution, uh, the entire cycle is going to be driven by the six entry points. And from our perspective, uh, from Together 2030 perspective, the, G, the, uh, the GSDR has many gaps. One, and one of the main gaps is that the transformative aspects of the 2030 agenda get diluted. Uh, by by the by the entry points. So those are some some thoughts uh, that I leave with you. And thank you very much for for the invitation to participate here. And uh, um, ready to join up with uh, this uh, with um, Foros and and TAP and A4SD uh, in future endeavors. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Arellis. And the final speaker then, um, uh, Adriana from uh, Sluga. If you could give us your concluding remarks. Yeah, thanks a lot. And thank you very much also for a very interesting discussion. There's not much to add about the spotlight reporting and the uh, uh, need to reflect on the VNRs in the spotlight reports, maybe just a comment on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it certainly will, it sets a different stage for the implementation of the SDGs. And on one hand, the pandemic highlighted that the virus, viruses or any um, let's say threats or potential challenges don't obey national borders. But on the other hand, we see the trend of states and societies turning inward. So clearly there's a need and opportunity for strengthened advocacy for global solidarity and a coordinated response to ensure that no one is left behind. But then talking about this principle, of course, we have to know whom are we talking about when we talk about implementing the principle of leaving no one behind. So also there's a need for qualitative data to ensure that no one is left behind, be it on national, regional or global level in general when implementing the agenda, but also in the COVID-19 response. So thanks again for this opportunity. It was very interesting for me to listen to different opinions. Thanks, Adriana. And I think that what you mentioned there about global solidarity is a really important message to finish with. And this is why the four global networks that are organizing this webinar have come together, you know, so consistently now over in recent times, because we see that the COVID-19 pandemic, as you said, respects no national borders. It's affected you know, the human society globally, and we need a civil society to respond uh, not just nationally and locally, but also regionally and globally, and to make sure we coordinate our responses and we push that message of global solidarity, which I think will be at the heart of the citizen action campaign that, that Ollie was talking about earlier. So just to say to everybody, thank you very much for participating in the call today. We will send on um, both the... Um, the audio recording that we've made of this, this call later to you, but also copies of all the PowerPoint presentations. And so if you want to follow up with any of the speakers or you know, go to any of the websites of the organizations that were participating in this call, 
please do. And if you need any follow up uh, information or support from us, please do reach out and contact us. So thank you again for participating and um, have a good day and a good week. So goodbye, everybody. And thanks again for your participation. <laughs>